Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve begins a timely and revealing end time series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? We'll discover what is happening, what the future holds, and how you should prepare in a message entitled, He Never Said It Would Be Easy. If you have your Bible, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy was the last letter Paul ever wrote before he got his head cut off under the persecution of Nero. It was written about 66, 67 A.D. Timothy was Paul's true child in the faith. Paul picked up Timothy on his second missionary journey from Lystra, and he took him with him uh, on his missionary journeys. And Timothy was the pastor in Ephesus. Paul had set him up there. Timothy was a guy who was uh, different from Paul. Paul was a guy who would charge hell with a water pistol. Timothy was a little more timid, and Paul had to tell him, hey, uh, God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity, Timothy, but of power and love and discipline. You have to remember who you are and whose you are, and he encouraged Timothy in the faith. Well, he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. Hey, what's it going to be like, future shock, what's it going to be like in the last days? In the days we're living now, but then in the future, what is that going to look like? Well, God tells us this. He knows the future. He wants us to know the future too. You know, when the scripture says that in the last days, you know, the Bible uses that a lot, the last days, the last days, and people say, well, what constitutes the last days? The last days are a long period of time. They're really just the gap between the first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. All those days in between are the last days. Now, when Paul wrote, he's writing in the last days. He's writing 66, 67 or so uh, A.D., and now here we are, and we're in today's time. And so it is safe to say if Paul was living in the last days in 67 A.D., we are living in the last of the last of the last days. What does the Lord say about living in the last days? Three discoveries. Discovery number one, the days will become increasingly violent and dangerous. That's one of the things that he says. Evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. In the Amplified, we get a a better feel for what that exactly means. And the Amplified Bible says this, But understand this, that in the last days will come, set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. That's what we're facing in these last days. Now, the Lord wants us to understand the days. He wants us to understand the times. That's why he said, hey, realize this, understand this. God wants us to know. Now, why does God want us to know? As we read those verses about uh, the 19 characteristics of people in the last days, good night. Sounds horrible. I don't want to read this. I didn't come to church, Jeff. It's for you to tell me how bad it is and how bad it's going to get. 
Well, I'm not. I'm just telling you what God says about the last days. He said, well, is this just designed to scare me? It's not designed to scare you. It's designed to prepare you. Here's the thing that many people forget. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. It, it's, it, it, you're called into a battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Hey, we're at, we're at war. That's why Ephesians 6 says you better dress for the battle. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. What kind of a soldier goes to battle uh, wearing flip-flops and, and a, a noodle? Uh, you know, he's going to the beach. You're not going to the beach. You're going to the battlefield. And we need to remember that. We're in a battle. And God is saying, this is what's going to happen in these last days. So you need to get ready. Not to scare us, but to prepare us because the Lord wants us to know what's coming down the pipe. And he says it's going to be violent and it's going to be dangerous and it's going to be difficult to say the least. So be aware. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. God wants us to understand the times. And God wants us, secondly, to understand man without the fear of God. One of the basic, basic, basic commands in the Bible is the fear of the Lord. We are to fear the Lord. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. We read in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the ABCs. It's like learning a language. What do you, if you're going to learn English, what do you learn? You learn the alphabet. You learn the ABCs. What are the ABCs in the spiritual realm? The fear of the Lord. It's the first button on your shirt. If you miss that button, I don't care how you do the other buttons, your shirt is off because you missed the first button. The fear of the Lord is the first button on the shirt. It's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, and we're living in a world today where men do not fear God. Women don't fear God. Boys and girls don't fear God. We used to live in a world where people had a, they might not have been Christians, but they had a fear of God. And a fear of God says that you recognize that God is God and you're not God. You recognize who God is and who you are. I am, in relation to God, a pimple on a flea because God is so great. The fear of the Lord, and we've lost that. And you know what we've replaced the fear of the Lord with? We've replaced the fear of the Lord with the love of self. See what it says in verse 2? Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self. I'm not going to love God. I'm not going to fear God. I'm not going to acknowledge God. Why? Because it's all about me. It's all about me. That's the world we live in today. We live in a world where people want to be their own God. They've lost the fear of God. Wow. You know what the Scripture says about that? It says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When you read in Revelation chapter 20 of God's judgment of the wicked, all those who spurned him, all those who rejected him, they come before him at the great white throne judgment, and it is a terrifying thing. It says earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. Nobody wants to be there. There ain't going to be one person at the great white throne who saunters up into the face of God and say, I don't believe in you, God, and I'm not afraid to go to hell. They're going to be wetting their pants at the, judgment, at the great white throne judgment. It is a terrifying terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so God says, hey, in this, these last days, people reject the fear of me. They choose the love of self, and that opens the floodgate, and that opens the sewer pipe of all sorts of terrible, horrible things. Second discovery. 
Not only will the days become increasingly violent and dangerous, the days will see a rise in false teachers and false teaching. Verse 6. He says, for among these that hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. Hey, what's going to happen in the last days? Well, things are going to get dangerous because people are loved, or they're going to be brutal and haters of good, and they love pleasure more than they love God. But then also you're going to have a rise of false teachers and false teaching. And they teach destructive heresies, even denying, the Bible says, the master who bought them. That's why they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They deny the power of the gospel. They deny the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they oppose the truth. And that's what he says. They're just like he he likens them to two guys during the days of Moses, Janus and Jambres. You say, who are those guys? Well, they were the magicians of Pharaoh. That's what the Scripture says. Janus and Jambres. Now, we don't get their names in the book of Exodus, but in extra-biblical Jewish writings, we find out about these two guys, and obviously that's who they were because Paul put it in the Scripture. God by, uh, inspired Paul to write about these two guys, Janus and Jambres. And in the movie, The Ten Commandments, if you, if you watched that last week, uh, Moses calls those guys in the movie by Cecil B. DeMille. He calls his magicians Janus and Jambres. And here they are, and they oppose Moses. Well, how did they oppose Moses? See, they hold to a form of godliness. They come across like they're spiritual. But they deny the power of the gospel. You know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. There's power in the gospel. These guys deny the gospel. But they have power just as the Egyptian magicians had power. You remember uh, Moses takes Aaron's rod. He comes before Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, forget it. I don't know who you are. I don't know the Lord. And so Moses did a miracle. He threw down Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod turns into a snake. But Janus and Jambres, they get their magical arts going, and their rods become snakes. Aaron's rod eats their snakes kind of as a tip-off. Something's different with these guys. Second plague on Egypt was turning the Nile to blood. That ought to get your attention. But Janus and Jambres could do that too. Third plague that came down the pike on Egypt. Frogs. Frogs. Man, they had frogs everywhere. Janus and Jambres could produce frogs too. Fourth plague, gnats. Janus and Jambres couldn't produce the gnats. Kind of interesting how God put the, the, uh, just the limit on it. You can do all this other stuff. You can't make gnats. They couldn't make gnats. So what did they tell Pharaoh? They said, this is the finger of God because we can't do it. And so, uh, you know, you want to run with God. God's just going to leave you in the dust. So fourth plague, they couldn't do. Fifth plague, the, the plague on the cattle, they couldn't do that. Sixth plague was boils. They couldn't even come and appear before Pharaoh. You know why? Because they were covered in boils. God has such a sense of humor. Uh, you, these guys are thinking they can hang with God and hang with the miracles of God. They can't. And listen, the false teachers, they might be able to do some stuff because there's demonic power there. But they've denied the true power of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And they oppose the truth. They stand against the truth. Listen, What do we do in these days where there's so much false teaching out there? Hey, you say, "Ah, how do I know who's genuine, who's true? How do I know who's a sheep and who's a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, Christians must not be spiritually weak and undiscerning. See, it says in verse 6, For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. Spiritually weak women. 
It's not talking about they hadn't been to the gym in a while. It's these, are, these are women who are just spiritually weak. They don't know the word of God very well. And they're probably not under the authority of their, uh, the protective authority of their husband or the protective authority of the church. And so they're sitting ducks. They're just spiritually weak and they have sins in their lives and they're weighed down with sin and with guilt and these false teachers like the crocodile comes into the water they come without a ripple and they go after them you know, if you've watched the national geographic channel and you've ever seen the lions when they hunt you know the bible says that satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour you watch lions when they go after a pride of of kudu or some kind of wildebeest or something like that what are they, who do they get? They get the, the strongest, fastest wildebeest? No, they get the one that just can't, can't quite make it. Like, man, I got a bad hip. Hold on, gang. You know, and it's that kind of deal. And the lion gets him. He, he doesn't get those that are moving fast with the pack. He gets the weak. He gets the, the ones that can't quite make it. You know, lions aren't saying, well, I'm not going to eat that when he's weak. It tastes good to the lion. He doesn't care. And so here, how do you protect yourself? How, how do you keep yourself from being um, attacked and duped and deceived by the false teachers and their false teaching? You spend time in the Word of God. That's how. You build yourself up. The Word of God is milk, it's meat, it's food, it's bread, it's what helps us grow. And so you spend time in this book and you spend time under the covering of a Bible-believing church. And you don't get out there on your own thinking, well, I can do this on my own. Uh, that, that, that's not good. You need the protection of the church and the weak women laid down with sins they're outside of the protective covering of the church. I know some people like this. And they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And they're duped by the false teachers and the false teaching. Now listen, you got to remember something about the devil. The devil is a deceiver. And he is good at deception. The Bible says that if possible, he'd deceive even the elect. Don't ever think, well, he could never deceive me. Baloney, he can deceive any one of us. If God weren't protecting you, you'd be in big-time trouble. Let me tell you how deceptive the devil is. When Jesus came, as we talked uh, Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was coming to them as their Messiah, and they received him as such for a very short time until they said, well, you're not overthrowing Rome. Crucify him, crucify him. Jesus said this. He said, I come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. And when the Antichrist comes, the Jews are going to say, that is our Messiah. I mean, you talk about getting it 180 degrees wrong. No, your Messiah came in on Palm Sunday, and you said crucify him on Friday. This is the devil incarnate, and he's the one that you hail as Messiah. Hey, the devil is slick. you got to know this book, and you have to be discerning. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many have gone out. So test the spirits. You make sure that that person hasn't denied the only master and savior, Jesus Christ. And then discovery number three, the days will require Christians to be good soldiers. Paul told Timothy, in chapter 2, verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Remember what we said? The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. You're not coming to the Christian life like it's a day at the beach. Bring my flip-flops and my noodle and my floaties because it's all just, we're coming to church just to, just to sing kumbaya and hear about how the Lord loves us. Hey, it's wonderful, and the Lord does love us, but the Lord has put us in battle. And the Lord reminds us, your citizenship is in heaven. You're not citizens of this earth. 
You're strangers and aliens. And we used to sing that song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid, are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And that's so true. And so we have the mindset, if we're going to be biblical, if we're going to be wise, if we're going to be walking with God, especially in these last days, we need to have the mindset, I'm in the Lord's army. Man, I'm a soldier in the Lord's army, and I want to be a good soldier. And listen, good soldiers know that it's going to be hard. I know many of you saw the movie American Sniper. Chris Kyle, Navy SEALs, Special Forces. Those guys know it's not going to be easy. They don't go into Special Forces thinking, well, what do you got with you? Well, I got my flip-flops, I got my noodle. It's just going to be a blast. They know it's not like that. They know it's going to be hard. And listen, we need to start getting the mindset of a soldier, of a special forces soldier that says, he never said it was going to be easy. And so I need to go into it knowing, hey, in the last days, difficult, dangerous, hard times are going to be there, and I'm going to be ready for those by God's strength and by God's grace. So a good soldier, he endures hardship. Good soldiers don't quit. They don't quit. Did you know that the statistics say that 1,500 pastors quit the ministry every month? 1,500. Some of them because it's moral failure and they're out. Some of them get pushed out. Some of them just get so depressed that they throw in the towel and quit. Listen, I have been on both sides of this because I was in my 30s when God called me in the ministry. You can look at the ministry as... as, uh, an outsider from, from here looking to the platform, and it can seem like, you know, you hear, always hear the jokes. Well, you guys, you only work one day a week. Oh. <laughs> Listen, now I know working is hard because I did that. Ministry is hard too. It's just hard in a different way. It's emotionally hard, and it's spiritually hard because you get attacked from the enemy. And there's no doubt that a lot of pastors quit because they just get so discouraged They just don't want to do it anymore. And they get people griping and complaining about this and that and the other. Not you folks, other guys, you know. (laughs) But here is a poem. I've shared with you this poem before, but I love it. And you might be here and you might be ready to throw in the towel on your Christian life because you just say, it's just so hard. I want to let go, but I won't let go. There are battles to fight by day and night for God in the right, and I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I'm sick, tis true, and worried and blue and worn through and through, but I won't let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I will never yield. What? Lie down on the field and surrender my shield? No, I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. May this be my song amid legions of wrong. Oh, God, keep me strong that I never let go. Listen, don't ever let go. Don't ever quit in your walk with God. It will get hard because it gets hard in battle. But don't quit. And let me tell you some good news before we close. Good soldiers... You know what happens to them, good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ? They experience divine deliverance. Paul said, hey, Timothy, you know the persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And he says in chapter 4, verse 18, some of the last verses he ever wrote, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. My friend, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Listen, the way to get ready is to open your heart to Jesus. So why don't you do that right now if you've never done it before? Just pray with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, make me the person you want me to be, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you pray a prayer like that from your heart and mean it, the Lord will come in 
and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you. Take the time to write me, to email me, so we can pray for you and be a blessing in your life. Today's message, He Never Said It Would Be Easy, is from Pastor Jeff Shreve's series, Future Shock, and available in multiple formats. Call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org to get your copy. For thousands of years, people have longed to know what the future holds. Is there going to be a day when life as we know it ends? Is God going to destroy the earth at some point down the road? What does the Bible say about things to come? Of course, with wars and terrorism, earthquakes, famines, floods, rapid technological advancement, a falling away from the true faith and more, we're all asking the question, what in the world is going on? Well, the Bible is clear about exactly what is going on and what is to come. That's why I'd like you to be informed and prepared for the future shock that is fast approaching by sending you my eight message series simply titled Future Shock, What in the World is Going On? And then the companion booklet, How Near is the End? Now, I believe both of these resources will help prepare your heart and your home for the soon return of Christ. Get Pastor Jeff Shreve's eye-opening and timely nine message prophecy series, Future Shock, What in the World is Going On? Plus his revealing booklet, How Near is the End? Both resources are our special thank you for your support of any amount this month. Go to fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171. Don't be shocked by the future. Get Future Shock today. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org.